Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Sunday, April 7th, 2019, and this is the weekly market update. So the first thing I want to talk about is a broad subject, but I think impacts our uranium investments. And what I'm beginning to see is a sediment change, a positive sediment change towards nuclear power. And what I mean by that is uh, I follow quite a few people on Twitter and do searches for news items relating to nuclear power. And what I'm seeing is more and more so-called influencers becoming more positive on nuclear energy, specifically as a way to deal with the perceived threat of climate change my view is a little bit different. I believe that uh, it's the cleanest, cheapest, best power source, but the insistence of people to worry about CO2 seems to be a driving force for the Western OECD countries. Suffice to say that uh, people are now coming around to the fact that if they want less carbon in the atmosphere, they want less coal burning, more, less natural gas burning, that nuclear is going to have to play a role in doing that. I mean, let's face it, if you are an advocate for renewables, you're an advocate for natural gas peaking units. Bottom line is that wind and solar have capacity issues. They cannot run all the time, so they have to be backed up by quick, quick fire, natural gas fired peaking plants. So I think that, you know, people that are worried about climate change caused by carbon emissions are coming around to the fact that nuclear has to play a role. You know, we've talked about this before, but Bill Gates, who everybody I think would consider an influencer, he's become an advocate for nuclear power. We've also seen people that were part of Greenpeace at one time. They are becoming advocates for it. We've seen guys like uh, on Twitter like Mike Schellenberger. This guy is an environmentalist that was big into renewables, and then he took a dispassionate look at nuclear power and realized that the fears and the pushback against it was actually overblown. And I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, why that is. I mean, quite frankly, when you look at the math, physics, and practicality of nuclear, it just becomes obvious. But the problem is, is people do not have a dispassionate view. They have a view that's been skewed by 50 or 60 years of propaganda related back to the Cold War when we were at odds with the Soviet Union and were worried about a thermonuclear war. I mean, you can look back to the 1950s and see the comic books about nuclear war, uh, people hiding under desks, drills. You can go on YouTube and see this. And I think, you know, this idea has permeated people's minds. And people have been propagandized over many years. I think uh, what's encouraging is there was a New York Times editorial yesterday. I will put a link to it, but it was very positive towards nuclear power. What I found very interesting, though, were the comments under the editorial. There's five or 600 comments, and quite a few of them, I'd say the majority of them, were against nuclear, but and against nuclear power, but it was all the same regurgitated things we've heard before. Nuclear accidents, what do you do with the waste? I mean, people just don't know the facts, and the nuclear power industry really doesn't do itself any favors. They don't go out and actually talk about uh, the positives. So it's left up to people um, on Twitter and writing articles in an obscurity. But like I said, a sediment is changing. But I think it's instructive to, if you're interested in this, to, to read this op-ed, which like I said, I'll put a link to, and then peruse the comments because you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about when I say that uh, people have been propagandized. You know, we've talked about nuclear waste. I mean, the facts are that if you take all the nuclear waste from all of the nuclear reactors that have ever operate, been in operation, it would all fit into one size of a Walmart, one Walmart. The fact that nuclear energy or uranium is so dense of an energy source is actually 
fundamentally one of its advantages when it comes to waste um, as opposed to like coal power I mean when you burn coal you have residual ash left over and this is deposited in ash ponds around the power plants I mean Duke Energy had a situation several years ago where one of its ash ponds leaked into the, I believe it was the New River I mean these are the kind of things you get with uh, with coal burning and with natural gas, you get you know the emissions that the environmentalists don't want to see. You get the carbon emissions. And if you're into renewables, if you're into wind, it has a 30% capacity factor. What do you do for the 70% of the time that the wind's not blowing or, or the p plant's not producing? Well, you have to use backup uh, natural gas-fired power plants. So, you know, we talk about the accidents. That was another thing addressed in the, in the article or the opinion piece that was in the New York Times. You know, we've had three major accidents, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. But there was minimal loss of life. I mean, there was an article recently that the residual effects of Chernobyl, but, I mean, it's hard to gauge, right? I mean, the lifestyles that the people in Ukraine were, that have, as far as a lot of smoking and alcohol consumption, could be skewing early deaths. But, you know, in the end, more people die falling off roofs, installing solar panels then die from nuclear power that's just a fact nuclear power as a based on the amount of energy it produces relative to the other sources causes less deaths per trillion kilowatts that's just a fact so i think some other good news that we saw in the last week or two was that um, china national nuclear corporation has told people that uh, their nuclear build out is back in play they have the capability they didn't say they would do it but they have the capability of building six to eight reactors per year for the next 10 years i believe they will do this and i'll point out why as i've pointed out in the past it's all has to do with the particulate matter and smog in china in the urban areas um, i think building out nuclear in china does several things for china it, it's capital spending that will stimulate the economy and the economy seems to be slowing down in China it's not a bridge to nowhere because what you're doing is you're substituting nuclear clean nuclear power for the coal power that's causing the problems uh, with pollution in China you diversify your energy mix no country strategically should be focusing on one form of power obviously China has to import natural gas and oil so diversifying with nuclear power is to their advantage. And basically the main reason, I believe, which is to produce the huge amounts of clean power that they need. They're not going to be able to do it either with renewables, even though they have some of the spent the most, I think, of any country on renewables, they still need nuclear power. As I've said before, the bottom line is, is that the renewables just do not, aren't online enough sufficient to supply major industrial countries with all of their power so you know this is why China must fix the problem and they have to do it soon because this air pollution not co2 emissions but air pollution is a big problem in China the government must respond as people are getting restless about this issue uh, people as they become wealthier in China middle class they become more concerned about these type of issues especially about their children. I mean, people in China don't have three, four, or five kids. They have maybe one or two children. And would you want to raise your children in this type of smog, especially when you're going to be relying on these children to take care of you in your old age? You know, at some point, if the Chinese leadership, even though it is a communist situation, it's a communist party, they have to deal with this problem, or at some point the people will call its legitimacy into question um, and as I said this is not about co2 in China this is smog from internal combustion engines and coal burning for electricity I mean the, the country rapidly urbanized the cheapest fastest way to get the electricity they needed was to build coal burning plants that's what they did and now they have this situation where they just have so much pollution that people are literally choking on it it has to get fixed nuclear is the solution it will be the solution you know, I go back to this idea that, you know, people are worried about, well, what if Germany shuts down three or four plants and we're not going to build any more plants in the U.S.? Guys, let's look to Asia, India, 
China, places like this. I mean, I believe the UAE is just getting ready to commission its first plant. The growth is in the emerging and frontier markets for nuclear. It will not be in, the, in Europe and the United States. Um, the European people and the people in the United States are fascinated and seem to want to go down this path with renewables, which is, you know, stupid in my view. Uh, but in the end, economics, practicality, and math and physics are outing. And people that are in you know, societies that don't skew their thinking with politically correct views, uh, environmental wacko views like in China and India, that practicality is that they need tremendous amounts of energy. And if they try to supply it with coal, they will choke themselves to death. Shifting over to oil now, I mean, the trend is our friend here, guys. Uh, after the big blow up in Q4 of last year, you know, we've been on this steady increase. You know, the trend is our friend. We've talked about before. I'm not going to get into it too deep. I uh, just want to move on to a couple other items this week. But I think we're going to see oil move higher over the remainder of the year. Um, the Saudis have cut back. They're maintaining discipline in OPEC. And the storage numbers are coming down. We're coming out of the main refinery maintenance season at the end of April. And then there will be the refinery runs will increase as the summer driving season approach approaches and you will see some big draws in crude in my view i'm looking at uh i still think we could see 70 75 dollars a barrel sometime this year in west texas intermediate even at these prices quite a few most emps are reporting substantial cash flow and many of them really good earnings at this level of pricing if we move higher, I believe that uh, we'll see some record cash flows in a lot of these companies. And the hope is, and our view is, is that uh, this will get recycled into additional exploration and production, being that we've seen a five-year dearth of new of reserve replacement and the finding of new uh, oil and gas reserves. That has to change. That's going to require hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. And that's the thesis for our oil services uh, offshore theme that we are very, very bullish on. As a matter of fact, uh, as a plug here, I would uh, mention the uh, Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter that I publish, $79 per year. And I think you will see that if you were to subscribe, take a subscription to it, you would see that uh, we are very skewed towards a recovery in offshore oil exploration anticipate uh, really big gains as the these tremendous cash flows by the oil companies get recycled into the exploration and discovery and production of new offshore oil fields. Um, I don't know how many of you remember, but Matt Simmons was a guy that was an analyst he had a company called Simmons and Company. I believe they did a lot of analysis of for exploration production companies. This is going back about 10 years ago. And he wrote this book. It was called Twilight in the Desert, The Coming Saudi Oil Shock and the World Economy. Um, Mr. Simmons passed away almost 10 years ago, right around right after this book was written, not too long after. But his thesis was that the Saudi Arabians had been let's put it this way, not putting out correct information about their oil reserves. You know, what was interesting about Saudi Arabia is, I think back in the 70s, they went, the last time they actually published their reserves, they said they were 250 billion barrels, and they just kept saying that they were 250 billion barrels, even though decades had passed of production. I think a lot of this was because inside of OPEC, your quota is basically based on how big your oil reserves are. But Mr. Simmons' case was, you know, oil fields deplete over time. We know this. And what are, what are the true Saudi reserves? Are they actually what they say they are? They certainly can't be if, if they've been producing for decades. But the kingdom has been very, very uh, secretive. It's a national secret. Well, what's interesting is, is that Saudi Arabia inf put out a bond they sold some bonds recently, and in the prospectus they talked about they talked about their biggest oil field, Gawar. This is like the granddaddy of all big oil fields, 
And the view was, or the assumption in the industry, in the oil industry, was that this field was producing about 5 million barrels per day. And what the Saudis said in the uh, bond prospectus revealed that Garwar is able to pump a maximum of 3.8 million barrels a day, well below the more than 5 million that had become conventional wisdom in the market. And there's an Art Bloomberg article that I will put a link to in the show notes, which I suggest you take a look at. But, uh, I mean, this is basically the big banana. This is the main Saudi oil field. And if this thing is producing less than people thought, then what does this really mean for Saudi Arabia's oil reserves and its ability to act as a swing producer? You know, I've talked about this before. You know, we've had five years of an, of a just lack of investment in new oil reserves all around the world because of the volatility we've seen in oil prices. We now are seeing that major oil companies that are publicly traded have to report their reserve life indexes. They have to tell the market how much oil they have left. And it's been going down over the last five years because the investment has not been made in finding new reserves. And, you know, this is an extractive industry, as I've said before. So you have depletion. What you produce, you have to find if you're, or you'll eventually go out of business. And demand is relentlessly increasing, especially in the emerging and frontier markets. We've talked about it before. Um, this idea that oil is just going to go away or we're going to replace it with electric cars, that may happen in decades, but it's not going to happen in the next five or ten years. Oil not only is used for transportation, but petrochemicals, medicines, plastics, paint, I mean, all kinds of things. It's just, you look around your house, you can just, everything is quite, just about everything has a petroleum base. So the view here is if one of the largest producers in the world maybe doesn't have the reserves or production, production capacity that it was advertising for many decades, what does this mean for world oil prices going forward? I mean, Grosing, or Goring and Rosenzweig talked about this in a blog post several months ago, which I'll put a link to also in the notes. What are the Saudis' real oil reserves? And now they've come out and said their largest field is producing quite a bit less than people thought. You know, here's a chart or here's a graph from the article that talked about this. I mean, you see Gawar is basically, like I said before, the big kahuna, the big banana of Saudi production. And it's only 3.8 million barrels per day. I mean, this is a huge oil field. It's 150 miles long. It's just huge. And it's been producing since, you know, what did I say on this last one? Since 1938. You know, this thing isn't going to last forever. So this is very important to understand. I think this is really not talked about that much. But, um, you know, I guess we're going to say now that the Permian Basin is the largest producing oil field in the world now at over 4 million barrels per, per day. But what does that mean? We're seeing, you know, actually cutbacks in the Permian. We're seeing companies not just drill, drill, drill with no regard for returns, I mean, you can't just keep drilling forever and shareholders not participating in any of the gains. I mean, no free, no positive free cash flow, no profits, and we're seeing more and more companies dial back. So I think this is going to lead to, like I said before, a reemergence in a desire to move offshore. A lot of the costs are for break-even on offshore projects are 30 to $40 a barrel. The only problem being that they're long lead time items. But I think that as the cash flows have really increased at a lot of these international oil companies, we will see a decisions being made for new projects going forward. Kind of wanted to point out this. Um, this is a got this off Twitter. It's a guy I follow, Eric Nuttall. He's a runs a um, private or hedge fund that invests in specifically oil and gas, and he's based in Canada, so he has a Canadian. Uh, bias, if you will. And, you know, if we think oil prices are increasing, which we do, they have, and we think they're going higher, we've not seen a response from a lot of the Canadian heavy oil producers. Um, just to take a look at this chart, you can see the red to the left is the price of Western Canadian uh, oil, West Western Canadian Select. It's been up 74% year to date. And WTI is up 36% year-to-date. 
yet some of the heavy oil stocks are down. Look at uh, Meg Energy, look at Athabasca, it's down 14%, Meg is down 31%. Um, but as it, Mr. Nuttall points out here, with the rise in pricing of WCS, the combined cash flow of ATH and BTE is up $450 million since January 1st, yet their collective market caps have shrunk by 150. And this is exactly the type of things that I look for in an um, actionable intelligence alert. We are looking for mean reversion here. If oil prices continue to go up, the cash flows continue to go up at these companies, at some point they will attract private equity, they will attract uh, competitors to merge with them, the managements of the companies will start buying back shares. At some point, we will get a reversion to the mean. And if, in the case of some of these companies, they are really, really uh, depressed. And, you know, there's a sediment view out there. Well, there's not enough takeaway capacity, pipelines, the Trudeau government. You know, in the end, if the cash flows are going up, the companies at some point can just start buying their own shares back and in quantity. I mean, there are some of these companies that are trading at, you know, 15, 20, even 30% free cash flow yields. You know, if you're trading at a 30% free cash flow yield, you could conceivably buy all your shares back in three years and go private. So we are seeing uh, this one of the things that Mr. Nettle does is he lobbies quite a few of these oil producers up north, and he has been successful in his lobbying to try and get them to start buying back shares. If no one else is going to buy you, then you should be, instead of, investing in new production, you should be recycling the cash and buying back your own shares because it's cheaper to do that. It's a better return than it is to go out and find new reserves and start producing them. So that's it for this week, guys. Uh, like I said, uh, hit that subscribe button. You know, Follow me on uh, YouTube. Follow me on Twitter. I really suggest you get on Twitter. There's a really a lot of smart people on there. You don't really have to get in there and start mixing it up and make a lot of comments, but you can lurk and you can learn a lot. There's a lot of smart people out there. I follow quite a few smart people uh, around nuclear energy, uranium investing, oil and gas, and you don't have to get on there and show cat videos and stuff. It's not like Facebook. So I would suggest that if you're not on Twitter and you're not following me and some of these other people, uh, you're really missing out on some really good, intelligent conversation and good ideas. So I suggest you do that. You know, again, take take a look at the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. Uh, it's seventy nine dollars a year. We really, you know, the things that we talk about in this these weekly videos is exactly the type of things that we invest in or speculate in, and that's where the really big, really big returns are. Places where sediment is really blown out and people really don't understand the fundamentals. Uh, they are listening to Kramer or reading Money Magazine or the Wall Street Journal. And when you're seeing it on there, it, uh, the event has already occurred. So we're trying to get in and the first inning of these things and be ahead of the be ahead of the game and kind of do that Wayne Gretzky thing. You know, we don't want to go where the puck is. We want to go to where the puck will be. So I encourage you to take a look at that. I'll put a link. Uh, but uh, definitely appreciate the um, interest and the support and the comments. And uh We'll just continue doing these videos uh, and getting this information out to you guys. So thanks a lot. Appreciate you listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.